Greetings, adventurers, and welcome back to the Den of the Drake. Other dragons hoard gold while I hoard internet cringe. Happy Halloween! I would suggest that we read an RPG horror story to celebrate the spookiest holiday of the year, but I would be doing that even if we were celebrating Hanukkah. So instead, I've elected to place a wolf spider near the corner where someone's fingers and thumb would be on a phone screen to make arachnophobic mobile users really uncomfortable as a compromise. You know, because I'm chaotic evil. Anyways, you know what's scarier than spiders and YouTubers who think that they're funny? Neckbeards! Yep, I'm sure you smelled it before you saw it. Yes sir, grab your fedoras and drive your box covered in Ahigo anime stickers, you degenerate, to your local game store and crack open an ice cold can of Mountain Dew with the homies, cause we got a neckbeard story. The story I have for you today stars a euphoric gentle sir in his 40s who spends his time playing D&D with people half his age. That alone might be a red flag, but throw in some incel adjacent tendencies, a craving for NSFW material, and a healthy serving of copyright infringement and you got yourself a recipe for some rather spooky shenanigans. Now without any further delay, let's go ahead and dive right into the horrifying world of r slash RPG horror stories. Enjoy. This week's story is written by Reddit user H. Rigel, and it's titled, Player Can't Hide His Frustration. I, 23 male, was the DM in a campaign that started because the other DM, 40 male, didn't want to be the master for a while and wanted to try new games. He was the kind of person who used to talk a lot about how he had 25 years of experience as a DM of almost only D&D and Pathfinder, but actually he was one of the most childish and immature players I have ever found. We were playing in a post-apocalyptic system and he complained about everything by saying that I was a rules lawyer. The core rules of this system are four pages. Like one of the racial abilities in this game says, once per session before you roll a check, you can say, I use luck, and it will automatically be passed. He called me a rules lawyer because he wanted to use this ability after rolling because the normal rule is unfair. Am I a rules lawyer, or is he actually just a person who wanted to win all the time? The fact that he started to add to his sheet important items that he didn't find, like fuel, is telling me that I wasn't such a lawyer. Meanwhile, his behavior in the campaign was equally cringe. His only purpose was literally f***ing every female NPC he met, and he insulted me because I didn't let him. Sometimes he was pissed because I used to show to the group pictures of NPCs that I found on the internet. According to him, my NPCs of a post-apocalyptic world weren't beautiful enough, mostly because they weren't based on some kind of hentai. That whole scene was embarrassing. Imagine a 40-year-old obese and unemployed man shouting at someone young enough to be his son because he couldn't f imaginary characters judged not beautiful enough. Side note, I have nothing against people over 40. Actually, I often played with people way older than me for guilds and events, but I expect them to act like adults. Anyway, we tried to do another campaign, and things got even worse. We started playing Blades in the Dark. If you don't know the game, the characters are a gang in a city based on the Victorian age. You have to create the gang too, and the creation was equally cringe. Obviously, he pushed the group for being pimps, which was okay. The game is often about pleasure, but during the gang creation, he refused to pay the coins to the gangs that he chose as allies because according to him, having a discount with their prostitutes was enough payment. I tried to explain that gangs pay each other with coin because their goal is to make money and power. Discount over prostitutes isn't enough of a payment for support. And guess what he said? Exactly. I'm a rules lawyer. Then they had to pick a rival gang to be at war with. They chose a gang called the Hounds, and I started narrating, You are at war with the Hounds. In the past weeks, your rivalry for the control of the business escalated in. And then the player interrupted me for saying that the gang war actually started because he had sex with the wife of the enemy leader. I continued by saying, So we begin with you and your hideout. 
He interrupted again for saying that they weren't alone. In the house, there were also two girls of the crew and he, you guessed it, was also having sex with them. I told him that right now they don't have a crew, but if they wanted it, they would need to get it with experience in a short time frame. He freaked out by shouting, we were in a park, that the book says gangs of tier zero can have up to zero to two minions. I responded only if they pick the crew feat in the game. He kept insulting me and shouting at me, saying that my game is shit and that you're an asshole who follows the rules. At that point, I asked myself, is it worth playing with a sexually frustrated 40-year-old who keeps insulting me because I don't help him by providing material for his masturbation? I answered no, and I left the table. Ah, gag, what an absolutely foul individual. No, you boomer-looking ass, telling you that you can't harass the female NPCs is not being a rules lawyer. It's called, you're making everyone uncomfortable, please leave. Don't be a perv may not be a rule in the player's handbook, but it's probably in the Bible or the Quran or the Torah or something. I don't know, pick one. What I'm trying to say is that you need Jesus or someone else's equivalent. So let's take a step back from the creepy 40-year-old here and talk about something else. Blades in the Dark. About six months ago, my only RPG experience was with D&D 5e because I was, and still am, a bit of a baby. So you can imagine how limited my field of experience was when people talked about how other systems worked. That was until I joined Crow's Purchase Patreon. Fun fact, me and Jacob Crow are actually subbed to each other's Patreon, so functionally once a month, him and I pass a $5 bill back and forth, but I digress. Part of his Patreon goals is being able to participate in a Blades in the Dark game that he runs. And oh my god, my mind is opened wider than the embrace of the woman that Ned Fulmer cheated on his wife with. Blades in the Dark has such a cool concept of taking the game to a more macro level. And it's awesome. It's got a big focus on progress as both an individual and as a party, which I really vibe with as you fight for control of a Victorian city setting. So, of course, my From Software slash Bloodborne simping heart is right at home. Plus, the game eliminates that cute little thing that D&D parties like to do, where they spend an hour of the session planning only for it to become irrelevant in the first five minutes of go time, by letting players spend in-game resources to do flashbacks and retroactively add new elements to the game that their character prepared beforehand. It's really cool, and I think more people should play it. What I don't want people to do is encounter gross people like our neckbeard here and say, hmm, more of that please, and continue to play RPGs with them, which is something that OP found themselves doing because surprise, surprise, we have a part two. Part two is titled, DM tried to hit on the only female player and almost ruined my life. After that experience, I was desperate. I, 23 male, couldn't find a new group after the first lockdown, and I don't like playing on Discord. I can't stay focused, plus my computer is the only place in my home without heating, and that time it was winter. So after some time during the second lockdown, the player of the last time, 41 male, we'll call him Michael. Yes, it's a fake name. We aren't even from an English-speaking country, as you may have noticed by my poor English said to me that he was sorry for what happened and that he wanted to play a Legend of the Five Rings. If you don't know, it's a game set in a world similar to Feudal Japan where the characters are samurai, campaign based on Dororo, an anime movie that he had watched. I was a bit skeptical because he is the kind of person that knows only D&D and Pathfinder in his personal vision. With personal vision, I mean, every time you try to say what your spell does, what the book says, he shuts you up by calling you a rules lawyer. But I was desperate, so I accepted because I thought he as a DM would be better. Since we were still in lockdown, we started the campaign on Discord. I wanted to wait to play in person, but everyone else wanted to start online, so I accepted to play online despite hating it. He made an announcement on a group to look for new players. We had a new player from a different region. I will call her Karen, 33 female. Since the beginning of the campaign, the DM was trying to hit on Karen. 
He made Karen the main character of the campaign, giving her powerful items and power-ups, allowing her to metagame, allowing her to do four actions in combat with a standard action, and so on and so forth. All while trying to flirt in every possible way in the group chat, and even praising her actions when she did metagame. By the way, his ways of flirting were the most embarrassing that I have ever seen since he was posting pictures of some manga where people groped boobs of the characters while saying, I want to be the bra. <laughs> or he kept mentioning Karen's breasts. Only woman in the campaign, mind you. While talking in the group chat. Or even better when he found out she was a vegetarian. Michael said that he was against the massive consumption of meat too. Which was funny because before the lockdown we went to fast food before playing and he ordered three burgers only for himself. Some examples of what happened in the campaign. We had the personal quest of finding the weapons of our ancestors. I wrote in my background about my search of the sword of a goddess, Lady Shinjo, the founder of my clan. Meanwhile, Karen didn't write anything at all. What happened? Not only did I not find my sword, but the DM made me understand that if I will ever find it, the weapon will be some kind of decoration unable to actually cut. Karen found a Yari, a bamboo spear, used by one of her ancestors. Her spear can literally shoot lightning bolts and fly through the sky. For those of you who don't know the game, there are two stats, honor and glory. You may gain or lose points based on the actions of your character. We killed a woman who was actually a demon, and the human who was helping her. So the DM said we lost glory because according to him, they were innocent. I tried to argue by saying that no one saw us doing it. The DM responded by saying that honor and glory are personal. It doesn't matter if people can't see us. The next session, Karen found some corpses and she wanted to bury them. Keep in mind that touching a dead body is one of the biggest dishonors for a samurai, and it causes a great loss of honor. I said to Karen, Be careful. Touching dead bodies is a dishonor for a samurai. She told me that she didn't care. Then Michael said, eh, There aren't any people around here who could see her. She won't lose any honor. The campaign was basically the ride of a crappy theme park on rails. You see the scene the DM prepared for Karen, NPCs only talking to her, spiritual trips where she spoke to her ancestors and so on, and then move on. On the other hand, Karen was extremely childish, and she enjoyed all the attention she was getting. After every session, she was threatening to start a PvP situation by saying things like, I may do something bad next week. Michael, check the five minute voice message I sent you. According to Michael, we didn't pay enough attention to her, too. Basically, when we had split the party, me and another player on the left, Karen and another player on the right, we had encounters with skeletons. While we were fighting, Karen summoned her legendary spear, so Michael asked to us, You don't have a reaction to her? I responded with a, No, I'm fighting for my life. I don't care what's happening outside the fight. Another time, the party found an orphanage run by a young girl. During the night, my character woke up and found out the girl was selling her body to some soldiers. I explicitly told that I would keep it a secret, because my character didn't want her to interfere with our mission. The first thing Karen did was find the girl and ask her where she was last night. And I can keep going on talking about how the campaign was bad because the DM didn't know anything about both the system and the setting. The fun thing is that she asked me to correct him when he was forgetting things. But every time I did, he said that I was a rules lawyer and too much bound by the books because I can't create something original. This is fun because every original setting made by him is literally just another game slash anime, but played with a popular rule set. He also didn't understand the game. He was playing a game mostly about intrigues, duels, politics, and war, like it was a dungeon crawler and then complained by saying things like, These games made for millennials are bad. During that period, international editors started pre-orders for our version of Cyberpunk Red. I said in the group chat that I was going to buy it. Michael offered me 10 pounds to contribute because he wanted the PDF version of the game. I usually let the other players use my PDF as long as they don't share it. 
I said it was okay, because they send you two codes for the digital version of the rulebook. One at the moment of the pre-order, and one in the last page of the book. Since I'm a student and the only one in the group that buys games, I'm glad when someone wants to help me buy them. Since the books were still being printed, we only had one code. I used it, but then Michael asked if he could have a copy of my version to read, so that we could start his totally original campaign based on the world of Alita Battle Angel as soon as possible. So I sent him a copy of the file, because I wanted to end that shitty campaign quickly. Keep in mind that when you download the PDF on every page, there is your name and the transaction code, so editors can track people using it irresponsibly. We kept going on with the campaign. After every session, we spent at least half an hour arguing. Me and Christopher, 34 male, longtime friend with Michael, against Karen and Michael, because the group didn't do what she wanted. I said I couldn't stand any more playing with a group of people who spend more time arguing than playing. Michael tried to save the game because he didn't want to lose favor within the group. Christopher, basically his driver, and me, I buy the rule books, begin to tell him exactly what's wrong with the campaign. We said that Karen was getting all the attention and favoritism, while the campaign was starting to get repetitive because of it. He freaked out by saying that she is a true good player, unlike you. And I responded, fine, then play with her, and left the Discord. The story could end there, but there is more. A week later, I saw a Facebook announcement in a group that Michael was in, selling a digital copy of Cyberpunk Red. I had a bad feeling about it, so with a fake profile, I said I was interested, and asked him to send me some screenshots. I saw that this copy had my name on it. Then I asked why there was that name instead of his. He responded by saying that my name was actually a fake name invented by him. He was selling a PDF bought by me with my name and the transaction code on it while claiming that I didn't exist. For this, I could be reported for piracy and copyright infraction by the editors, and being fined in the best case scenario, which is still bad because I study and couldn't pay for it, for something he did. He wasn't only the worst DM and player I have ever met, but also one of the shittiest human beings. Side note, in the end I found out that Karen left the group too, because she got tired of such a disgusting man trying to flirt with her. End of story. Ooh, that was a bit of an escalation from the last part. Now, I don't know who needs to hear it, but trying to seduce a woman based on things you saw in an anime is barely a step up from hitting on her with a line that you got from a video you found on a gentleman's website. It's just not a good look, my dude. That being said, the whole... Wait. Where's the spider? Oh. Oh god. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and choose to ignore that and hope that the sudden disappearance of the spider won't give anyone watching any level of anxiety over it possibly making a sudden and unexpected reappearance. Oh, that would be terrible. Anyone else feeling kinda itchy right now? Oh well, let's take a look at this week's Gallery of the Drink. This week's fan art comes from viewer Stardust Strix, and depicts a stoic drake ruling over all that he surveys. After all, everything the light touches is cringe. Hey Mufasa, first of all, big fan. I know that the loss of the baboon must have really been hard on your whole operation here. Uh, speaking of potentially being hard on the operation, that little kitten thing that you had me holding over the cliff here, how easy is it for you to make another one of those? Thank you again, Stardust Strix, for submitting your art. If you want to see your artwork featured in Gallery of the Drake, be sure to send it to the email in my About section. Fan art is my favorite part of doing YouTube, and it means the world to me that I can create content that inspires artists like you to create artwork like this. With the story over and artwork displayed, we're going to go ahead and wrap up. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and if you feel like supporting the channel further, my Patreon and merchandise links are in the description. I would like to thank you all for listening, and I hope to see you next time.
in the den of the drink. Also, good luck finding the spider.